This course is about competence. Specifically, it's intended to help you develop the competencies you need to facilitate the development of competencies for those you supervise. Competence, though, is more than simply skills. It's about knowledge and attitudes and so on that really cluster around those skills. So consider the supervisee who's developed a particular skill set. They're able to use those skills pretty adequately on a day-to-day -day basis, but then they encounter a particular situation that stymies them, where uh, their personal reactions or other circumstances get in their way of using the skills effectively. This presentation is concerned with interventions that will help with that. How do we develop critical reflection in our supervisees so that they can reach their own conclusions about how to more effectively intervene in particular situations? And so what we're gonna talk about today has both immediate implications, that is how you're gonna help your supervisees with their particular clients in front of them at the present time, but also longer term. That is, as you work with them in this way, you're also fostering skills and habits of critical reflection. And critical reflection is understood to be a foundational competence. This is true, for example, in the APA statement about competencies. You'll see that it's a foundational competence that undergirds all professional practice. And you can see as well in the SCRP competencies. In this case, it looks as if those who developed the competencies really had two things going. Uh, one is reflective practice and the other is use of self. So I'm just gonna bracket it with respect to reflective practice. And you can see that uh, some of the sub competencies include critically evaluating one's own performance. That's very much reflective practice recognizing when in a therapeutic impasse and seeking supervision consultation and so on. So in short, uh, the skills we're gonna talk about today are about facilitating reflective practice that are gonna help in the near term with clients the supervisees seeing, but also helping them develop uh, overall competence in reflective practice. Reflective practice is a competence, and like any competence, it involves not only skill, but attitudinal components. And the attitudinal parts include a willingness to be curious about your own performance and, and especially to be humble about it and really take a look and, and assume that you could have done better. The skill part it is multifaceted, but, but supervisors can foster it, especially by helping supervisees engage in critical reflection. Critical reflection involves the supervisee notices something about his or her performance that puzzles them or confuses them or, or simply that they'd like to think of ways they might have done it differently or better. Uh, the second phase is really the supervision part where the supervisor works with them to explore the context and their experience and, and how they might have done it differently. And finally, there's the resolution part where uh, it comes together for the supervisor who understands now uh, how they, he or she might have done it differently. The supervisor's task then is to help the supervisee explore the experience. And, and, and in this way, the supervisor's intervention is not unlike what we do as therapists when we help our clients explore their experiences and with the intent of developing new understandings and insights. So it's very similar in that respect. Please take a few minutes as a group to identify episodes in which you as supervisees had the basic skills to perform the psychotherapeutic tasks in which you were engaged, but found yourself puzzled about what had gone on or were unhappy with some aspect of your performance or, or simply wanting to do it better, and in which your supervisor was able to help you get to the place you'd wanted to get to. So what did your supervisors do to help you do that? Please treat this as if you're trying to come up with a, a prescription that you could pass on to other supervisors. Interpersonal process recall, or IPR, is a supervision process that's ideally suited to facilitate the kind of supervise the exploration that's part of critical reflection. This is a process developed by Norm Kagan during the 1960s 
when he was at Michigan State University training medical students and interviewing skills. He was using the still new medium of video recording and found that when he played back the video, people could really recall what they were feeling and thinking and, and so on as, as if they were back in that moment. And it really provided an excellent opportunity for reflection. So he developed a process in which the supervisor functions as what he called an inquirer, whose only role is to ask questions to facilitate supervisee reflection. The supervisor provides no feedback, interpretations, or even reflections only questions. It relies on video or audio recording, although the same process can be used in response to supervisee self-report if, if it's absolutely impossible to have a recording. In the pure version of IPR, the supervisee retains full control of the process, stopping the recording. On the Moodle site, you'll find a list of leads that you might use as a supervisor. Here are some examples. So here are leads to inspire affective exploration. So how did that make you feel? How did you feel about him or her? Do you remember what you're feeling? And so on. Uh, checking out unstated agendas. What would you like to have said to him or her at that point? What's happening here? And so on. Questions to encourage cognitive examination. What were you thinking at the time? What thoughts were you having about the other person at that time? Questions to help search out expectations, such as, what did you want him or her to tell you? What did you want to hear? And so on. What follows is taken from a video series I did back in the early 80s, in which Dick Hackney, the supervisee, took his work to a number of supervisors, including Norm Kagan. In this case, Dick is using an audio recorder rather than a video recorder, but it, it does a pretty nice job, I think, of illustrating the IPR process. As you interacted with your client, you told me that her name was Ina, right? Um, I go on the assumption that a heck of a lot was going on under the surface for you. Thoughts, feelings, uh, impressions you were having her of her, impressions you thought she was having of you. Uh, you know, the mind works a heck of a lot faster than the voice does, so that there were lots of things that they couldn't possibly have been time for you to say or deal with, but perhaps more important for you, there may have been a lot of things that you only vaguely perceived and couldn't find the words for, or weren't sure if you dared deal with, or, or didn't uh, trust. Or didn't trust. Um, when you listen to the tape, I know you could probably now talk about a lot of those things, but when you listen to the tape, I think you'll find that a lot of that kind of process, the things that were going on inside you, the things you thought were going on inside her, uh, a lot of that will come back to you. Whenever you remember any of it, just stop the tape. My role with you will be to pursue the story that you tell, but it'll always be your story. That is, you know what was going on, and you were there, you know what was going on in your head, my task is going to be to help you get as much of that out, put it in the form of language so that you can look at it and think about it. Uh, you may also get in touch with some things that you were thinking of saying, and this will be an opportunity for you to, to say what you were thinking of saying and right. listen to the sound of it. Okay. okay. So whenever you remember anything at all, relevant or irrelevant, just stop the tape and talk about what was going on. Okay, fine. Uh, just a, by way of introduction to this session. There, it was really like there were two sessions in this session. The first half of the session uh, was awkward. Uh, I was uncomfortable. She was uncomfortable. The second half of the session, we seemed to get into a groove, and I felt good. I saw her relax, uh, but I also got resistance from her in the second half of the session when I started uh, trying to plant some suggestion. So, there's something to work with on both in both halves of the session. I'm, I just turned to a place in the first half of the session to start. And I uh, have to play it to see just where it is. As a result, you've been probably carrying that around. Is that, is that what it is? Yeah, I'm like, you know, I, I chickened out. And, uh, Where's Don been this week? Has he been in the scene, too? Well, he was by once, just for like about ten minutes, and he was really kind of funny. 
Okay. Uh, she's been married four months, and her husband is John. However, in the last two or three weeks, a new man has entered on the scene. Um, and it's strange how he has entered, because he has suddenly become friends of her husband. And uh, he and Ina had a soiree just uh, a week earlier, uh, much to her surprise and, and I think to her delight. And so she hasn't uh, mentioned him yet in the session, so this is where I decided that I wanted to get his name into the session at this point. Uh, so let me go from there. What did you want her to do with that? I wanted her to acknowledge that, uh, or to at least make me current, that he was in her world at this point. Uh, at this early moment in the session, she's talking about what a terrible week she's had. And she's talking about everything except this new man. And I'm curious, partly, uh, is this new man still in the scene? If not, and if he is, then I am sure he's part of the complication. If he's not in the scene, then I would guess that's part of the complication. But she's not speaking to him. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not acknowledging him, and, and so I'm kind of forcing the issue there. Okay. How did she react to it? Well, I think she was a little bit relieved. I think she was waiting for me to make that move, because I, I think she's a little uncomfortable to talk about him. Uh, but as I remember, uh, th there was just a little bit of relief in her face when I brought his name up. Mm -hmm. How did that influence what followed? Well, I was delighted, of course. <laughs> I thought, yeah, you were right that time. I'm going to have to play it to see what follows. I, I can't recall right now. I told you, he, he, you know, I didn't know whether this would be a big deal for him or whether it was just nothing, you know, that he could just do. He acted just a little bit. Well, he didn't act real nervous. But I sure was. Mm -hmm. So I saw him coming, and I just stood out on the, on the porch, you know, until until... You know, I knew he'd seen me. Yeah. And then I went in. And he didn't even come and ask for me. But it's a good thing he didn't. <laughs> okay, I, I laughed at that point because I think she was... Uh, everything I was reading was, here, I put myself out on the porch where he'd sure, be sure to see me. Uh, yet I was nervous about that, but I, I didn't want to miss the chance. And then the sucker didn't even uh, say anything to me, and I thought, uh, well, all right, I, I think I thought, yeah, you probably deserve that. You're playing a game with him, and uh, it's not a bad game, but you're playing a little bit of a game with him, and he decided not to play it. So uh, maybe you got your natural consequences. So there was a little bit of satisfaction, I think, in my, in my reaction. Did you get any sense of what she wanted from you at that point? Did you get any well, this has her eyes? been troubling me all through this case. Uh, because uh, one minute I have a sense of what she's wanting, and then ten minutes later, uh, what I'm getting from her is just the opposite. Uh, in that particular moment, what I think she was wanting, uh, well, let me think. In a way, I think she was wanting me to react the way I did, because I think she recognizes the game. And I think if I had uh, taken her too seriously, uh, that it would eventually have led her into a trap. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's that serious. Mm -hmm. Any sense of how she feels about you at that point? I'm very comfortable with me. This is uh, probably, probably my biggest sense in, in this case, that she likes me, uh, she's comfortable with me, she will let me confront her. Uh, sometimes I get a little too close with something and she gets embarrassed, she gets nervous, and she will pull back. Uh, in that moment, I think she, I, I do think she felt good about uh, how I was.
this. Yeah. She did smile for following my life. She smiled. Any risks that you're sensing? Any questions that you're sensing? Sense of being on a tight wire? Not yet. Later. Later. <laughs> I'll try. You were just so hoping he would come and ask for you. Well, and not wanting to uh, have that encounter. Uh, well, yeah, it's like I don't really know. It's like the roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. It's up and down, up and down. Well, you know, he probably shouldn't be. I mean, I know he shouldn't be involved with me, but I mean, that. Well, I feel embarrassed. <laughs> A little, a little bit, but... I didn't believe her uh, when she said that. I thought that she was, uh... I thought she thought she ought to be embarrassed. But I didn't really quite trust that embarrassment. I think she was really just saying you're getting awfully close right now. What did you think you were getting close to? Um, the crisis of her indecision, I think. This is about the only way I know to say that. I think what she really wants is to be confronted by her, her, what she's doing in the world right now. Because I think she is really not quite sure what she wants, whether she wants to stay in her marriage or whether she wants to get out of her marriage. But she's very good at uh, protecting herself from that question. And at any given moment, she gets immediately into the moment and doesn't have to face the other half of the issue. When Don came up uh, to the house, she wasn't dealing with what will John's reaction be at all. Um, when Don is out at the scene and John is there, she's not dealing with Don's you know, existence at all. So what I was trying to do was bring those two, what I am trying to do is to bring those two worlds together. Uh, is there anything that you're tempted to do or say that you're holding back? Well, I think there is a part of me uh, that, that thinks she's uh, uh, being unrealistic and uh, playing games with herself, playing some dangerous games with herself, uh, maybe being a little bit under-responsible with her behavior. You're tempted to say that, but you don't. I, yeah, right. <laughs> what keeps you from saying that? What's I don't know that it would be therapeutic to say that. I'm, I guess I'm, if I... I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to think it was therapeutic, but I am. I'm not convinced of that. And uh, I, there's this. There's the uh, tight wire that you asked earlier. I think in, on this particular issue, I am walking a tight wire. Uh, sometimes I. It feels to me like I'm coaxing her right up to the edge of her uh, risks, and I don't want to push her too far there because I think I could lose her. Do you have a fantasy of what would happen if you lost it? Well, the only real concern I have is that uh, it would do some uh, damage to the relationship and we would have to rebuild. Uh, I don't have any greater fantasy. When you're on this tight wire, what does it feel like for you physically? Do you have that many part of your body? Uh, physiological kind of comedy. I might. I'm, I'm having trouble locating where that might be. I think I show it in my face more than anywhere else. I, I, my face, uh, my facial reactions probably start to, uh, to reflect that discomfort. Do you think she's aware of your discomfort? I don't. Uh, and maybe I'm misreading her. She's, uh, in terms of psychotherapy, she's very naive, and uh, in some ways she's really kind of a model client because she is uh, uh, so amenable to the process. Mm -hmm. I don't experience her as being critical of the process, though. Anything else you have? No, that's about that's about it. I mean, it's 
I shouldn't be thinking about other men. I, I haven't been married very long. Yeah. I mean, don't have a couple's wait about three years. <laughs> I don't know that there's a, uh, I don't know that there's a standard that most couples follow. I think it really depends on who you are. Well, I probably should have thought about all this before I got married. But I got a little scared before I got married. Yeah. But John was so sure everything would be perfect. Okay. And I, and I really would, I guess I really would like to, to be all the things, you know, mm -hmm. that, that he, that he wants. I really blew it, you know? You really blew it? By getting married? Is that what you mean? Well, not just that. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe being married is okay. But I, I blew it by being so dumb and so... I'm confused at that point. I really don't know what she's trying to say to me. And I, and I don't know that she knew what she was trying to say at that point. So I, I, I remember at the time trying to figure out where, where are we going with this? Um, what is it she's, it seemed to me she had made a jump at that point in her thinking and I couldn't catch up with it to figure out where she was. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember where we went from this. That does happen in, in our sessions. There are times, there are often times when uh, I have to catch up to her. She's, she's made that kind of a jump. At those moments, is there anything that you're tempted to say that you don't? Well, yes. Yeah. I, I think I have been... Uh, when I'm in one of those moments, I feel like I have been doing too much following. Maybe I ought to be getting more active. Yeah, maybe I ought to be confronting her more. Or just asking her, where, where are you going now? And what keeps you from doing that? Um, well, basically what keeps me from doing that, I think, is that uh, I, I'm, I'm working out of a model that I use of trying to get really grounded with the client in the first part of the session. Um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm saying I'm beginning to question my model a little bit because I, I do feel some impatience uh, to become involved. I, later in the session, I, in any session, I tend to get a good bit more active. Maybe I'm having trouble with my model here. Is there anything about her age, sex, physical appearance uh, that's having an impact on her? What is her age, sex? Um, she's attractive. She's just a little bit overweight. Uh, her personality is delightful. And uh, I guess I'd have to say she's my, my favorite among my clients that I'm working with. And I really do look forward to the sessions because it's they're they're fresh. Each session really is a fresh session, um, and I have a good sense. You know, almost always at the end of a session, I feel good about the session. Uh, it's that first half of that session that is the struggle for me. Maybe I maybe I'm too invested. I don't know. Uh, maybe how do you I'm want? Gonna, how do you want her to perceive you? How do you want her to feel about you? Well. That's, there are several different things, I think. I want her to like me. Uh, I want her to feel that she's getting her money's worth. Uh, I want her to feel that, uh, that I have compassion, that I, that I do understand uh, the world.
course, she's on board with me. Um, and I want her to to feel that ultimately that she doesn't need me. Uh, we talk about that just a little bit later in this session. In fact, but uh, I think those are basically. No, I think that's that. Let me uh, let me advance it. Some. Sure. How would you like him to be? How would you like him to treat you? Well, I don't want to not want me, but maybe if he didn't want me, I'd feel a little better about sometimes not wanting him. Okay. So if you could I can't feel get away, but he'd leave. I, if, if his love had a few uh, conditions, yeah. that would feel better to you? Yeah. It would depend what the conditions are. Are there any conditions now, do you think? Well, I think he doesn't want me to mess around with the guys. Yeah, okay. So that would, you're pretty sure that would be a condition that he would have. Yeah. Which is sort of why I think maybe. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't it interesting that that's kind of what you're flirting with? I think that's the high point of the subject. I think it's a high point because she came to that. Uh, she made that connection. Mm -hmm. And I didn't strategize to get her to come to that connection. I felt really good about that one. What enabled it to happen as you, as you were in that moment? I think a, a, a key question I asked uh, How would you like him to treat you? What enabled you to do that? I have no idea. I, I, when I heard that question, I was, I didn't know where it came from. It kind of surprised me too. Oh yeah. Yeah. As soon as I heard it, I knew it was a, that's a crackerjack of a question. <laughs> yeah. And now as I'm saying that, I'm aware that, uh, that there's no strategy at all behind that. That's pure intuition, which is what I was saying a while ago. I was a little bit worried about using. I hear the contradiction in my own statements there. You said before that one of your struggles was the issue of maintaining control. Yeah. So what's happening to that at this point? I'm going with the flow. I'm not, I'm not at all thinking of control. What happened, the way I put it together at the moment, I remember, was things we're in the group. It's like you go out on a sailboat and, and for a while you can't catch a cruise. All of a sudden, you catch freeze and the sails fill in. You know, you're not worried about freezes anymore. No, I was not worrying about freezes. Anything else? Uh, no. To tell you the truth, I think I got, I've gotten what I came for. Uh, <laughs> it's been exciting. Yeah, I'm, I'm rather pleased with what I, I think we just found. I want to conclude with a couple of observations. One is my appreciation for how flexible IPR is in helping supervisees explore different issues as they emerge. So for example, in the earlier part of this video, Kagan was working with Vic to help explore some of his countertransference. And then later in the video, Kagan shifted his questions to help Dick explore his model and how he was implementing it with his clients. So, so I think it has flexibility that way. I would invite you to think of it as a technique or process to use when you have a marker that indicates that the supervisee needs to engage in some exploration. To wrap this up then, let's take a few minutes to have your group discuss what you appreciated in the work that you observed and in what ways did you see a direct application to your own work?
And then also, what aspects of it would you have to modify in order to have it work in your setting? 